I am Casey Cunningham with the City of Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services, a landscape architect. I've been here for about 14 years working on green infrastructure, and I'm going to give a presentation here on Eco Roofs for our live certified. I'm technologically a bit inept, so hopefully this works. Portland roughly 1808. Today you can see there's a lot of rooftops, roads, parking lots, and um, get a sense of the problem there. We have a combined sewer like a lot of big older cities have, which was designed to overflow a combination of sewage and rainwater into the river during heavy rains. So we built a couple big pipes about 10 years ago, which intercept much of that and take it to the treatment plant. But in heavy rains, we can still have those overflows. Um, we haven't had any this year, but most years we have one or two still. So stormwater management has been the big driver for eco roofs and green infrastructure in Portland, but they do have multiple benefits, which is something I like to mention. Instead of just doing one thing really well, they do a lot of things. They also provide habitat. They reduce urban heat island. They sequester carbon. They look nice, etc. So another graphic of similar infrastructure typical hydrologic cycle before development about two-thirds of rainfall infiltrated into the ground and about a third of it was evaporated or evapotranspired by plants very little of it became surface runoff and then in a typical development scenario that's somewhat inverted, about two thirds of it does become surface runoff, about a quarter infiltrates into the ground and a little bit evaporates. And that runoff is you know, typically piped to the river as fast as possible, picks up heat off of the surfaces that it crosses, it picks up oils and metals and other pollutants. It causes erosion when it all hits the creek at the same time. It also causes basement sewer backups in low-lying houses, as well as a, a flooding. So traditionally, gray infrastructure has been used. This is our big pipe, 22 foot diameter at its widest. And to maintain that pipe, we uh, encourage green infrastructure, which can be just I guess the simplest is just using natural systems of soil and plants to treat runoff right at where it falls or as close to where it falls as you can. So examples would be green streets, also called bioswales, or just natural areas, as you see there on the left. Trees on the right there is um, Mount Tabor Middle School. That's a rain garden retrofit. So that was asphalt parking lot. And as you can imagine, those are classrooms and they're much cooler on hot days now because that asphalt has been replaced by plants. I think I mentioned most of this already. Again, it's just using plants and soils to treat water as close to the source as possible. In you guys' case for a winery, I imagine it's not as, uh, there's a lot of green space already, so maybe the stormwater management isn't the driver. It might be something like habitat or aesthetics or urban heat island or something like that. It's a more balanced hydrologic cycle. And this is a little Portland centric, but a real quick overview of our program around 2008. Our mayor instigated the Great a Green initiative, which funded seven acres of eco roofs in Portland, as well as 920 green streets or bioswales, planted a bunch of street trees and yard trees. It enhanced the size of culverts for salmon passage. It removed invasive species and protected natural areas. And that was what kind of got our program going. We were funded to provide a grant of $5 per square foot for green roofs and about 140, I think 140 projects were built through that program. So peak flow is another kind of stormwater benefit I didn't mention. So we've done some monitoring on green roofs and about 50% of the rain that falls on them in Portland never leaves them. It evaporates or evapotranspirates off the roof. And then of that 50%-ish that does leave, 
there's a large peak flow reduction, 100% typically, which means that water gets to the river at a much slower pace, hours later or days later even, which means the system doesn't surcharge as quickly as it would otherwise. Eco reefs also have benefits to temperatures, pollution reduction. Um, they do a decent job of removing nitrogen, phosphorus, copper and zinc off of roofs. Typically those are coming off flashing on the roof or sometimes the plants that go in or the soils that go in have phosphorus in them, but over time we see most of those things slowly start to decline. They provide insulation. Um, in our climate, they seem to do a better job in summer of keeping buildings cool than they do of um, insulating during colder temperatures, but there's a lot of studies and a lot of conflicting info on that right now. Air quality improvements, carbon sequestration and habitat. About eight or so years ago, we partnered with Audubon and they had volunteer citizen scientists who monitored birds on eco roofs during spring migration. And they found about, I think it was five or six species that nested on green roofs in Portland, native species. And they also found some species that were pretty unique and that they liked open grassland habitats and weren't things you might expect to see in say downtown Portland, like savanna sparrows. So that I thought that was cool because it said that these habitats, even though they seem kind of you know, isolated and maybe small in the big picture. They do provide some value to these species when they're to find themselves in urban situations. We've also had Portland State University students looking at insects on roofs. We found that it's uh, very expensive to identify insects to species level. We have three large um, display cases with pinned insects and hundreds of species in there. We don't know exactly what they are, but we can say that there's a lot of stuff that's on these roofs. So that's good. In Europe, particularly England and Austria and Switzerland and Germany, they've been building roofs targeting particular red listed or endangered bird species that used to breed in these urban areas on open rocky or open grassy areas and no longer do and they've had success at bringing these birds back into these areas at the black red start there which is one of those species in addition to the environmental benefits there's economic benefits with green roofing primarily that it extends the waterproofing membranes life by typically two that's based on european studies we don't have roofs here that are that old yet creates a new job and industry, qualifies for stormwater fee discounts if you're in Portland, and it also qualifies for the floor area bonus in certain parts of Portland. There's a new requirement as of 2018 for roofs over 20,000 square feet in the central city, which is downtown and central east side. They're now required to build eco roofs, and that is the most stringent requirement in North America, I believe. social benefits, they do create green space, they can be therapeutic, there's potential to grow vegetables and garden up there, and they just can connect people with nature in urbanized places where there generally isn't a lot of uh, a nature to connect with. Portland has over 500 acres now, about 17 acres. And by eco roofs, we're talking about the we define that as the thinnest soil and kind of the most sustainable design you can come up with. So very lightweight, drought tolerant plants, minimal irrigation. There's also roof gardens, which that's distinct from, which are deeper soiled, typically more than four inches. They could be several feet. They could have small trees and shrubs and be a bit more um, maintenance intensive. This is Portland's construction progress over the years. So on the design of eco roofs, you got your structural deck and your waterproofing that you'd have on any roof. On top of that would be the first layer, typically a drainage layer, which is often a plastic 
kind of a geotextile material that looks like a bunch of cups and water can kind of bounce between those cups and make its way off the roof. It could also be a thin gravel layer. Uh, if the roof has enough of a slope, you may not even need a drainage layer because the soil itself drains quickly or if the roof is small, very small. Um, on this drawing, there's an internal drainage downspout. People often put ballast gravel around those drains to just ensure that flow doesn't back up in that area. Sometimes you'll see ballast around the edges, around the parapet, or around any kind of rooftop equipment. So I think just to make it easier to maneuver and walk around, although most of these plants can tolerate occasional foot traffic. Vegetation is often sedums. Usually you see a mix of native and non-native sedums. Um, those are just kind of a reliable drought tolerant plant, but there are other options. If your goal were to habitat, you can do native wildflower seeds, bulbs, things like that tend to work pretty well, but they look great in March, April, May, and then this time of year they look you know, kind of spent, which is fine if that's, you know, if you're okay with that look. A lot of it depends on whether or not people can see your roof and then just what your goal is. Cost is really variable. It can be at the low end about $5 a square foot up to $30 and well over that per square foot. The cheap end is called built up or layered up roofing where you're just, you know, you, you put your membrane down, you blow in the soil, you throw the plants out by sedum cuttings, which are just little bits of sedum that root in over the winter when the rain comes, or seeds. At the more expensive end are pre-manufactured trays or rollout mats where you have 100% vegetation coverage from day one. They look, you know, great, but, and they're easy to install and they're fairly easy to take back out if you need to. They tend to be pretty pampered plants, so you can have to ease those plants from where they came from to life on a rooftop. The typical weight saturated is 12 to 25 pounds. That's in addition to snow loads or dead loads. So we often get asked, people ask if we can retrofit an eco roof onto an existing building. And usually you can't, usually roofs aren't designed to take that extra weight, but sometimes they are. So that's kind of step one is to get a structural engineer or an architect to look at your plans and determine what weight you can support. We discourage irrigation on our roofs in Portland for stormwater management reasons. They also can encourage weeds and other plants that benefit from that summer irrigation. Sedum can usually cut it through the whole year. Occasionally it can look burnt in the fall, but it tends to bounce back in the spring. I don't think I mentioned the soils on the previous slide. The soils are typically about 90% some kind of inorganic material. It's usually a fast draining, lightweight, like pumice kind of stone that absorbs water. And then 10% is typically compost or something that provides a little nutrients to the plants. Solar panel there and on the next slide you'll see a few more examples of that. PV and eco roofs tend to work pretty well together. It's kind of a mutual benefit. The, the panels benefit from the cooling of the plants and the soil and the evaporation around them. And the plants tend to gravitate towards underneath the panels where the, I think the moisture sticks around a bit longer and there's more protection from the sun. I like photos, so there's just a bunch of nice photos here of uh, residential examples. Commercial, that's south waterfront there in the larger image. These are all government buildings. The lower right, those lines that are going across are actually the drainage method for that design. Those are, it's a red cinder rock. And 
so water that's flowing through the soils gets to that coarser rock and follows those channels, which all direct to the drains on the roof. Institutional examples is OHSU and um, a couple of universities in town. And then there's a number of these um, demonstration examples in city parks and community gardens and hostel on the bottom right. So things to consider, the structural assessment is the first thing you want to do. Knowing what your goals are, whether or not you want it to look great in the fall, whether people are looking at it year round or you know, just just depends what your, your goal is for the project. It's much harder to grow plants on the south or west facing slope of a roof. It's you know, ideally you're facing east or north. Um, also, you want to consider where adjacent shade is coming from. If there's a building nearby or trees nearby, there's always a bunch of microclimates that develop on roofs based on things like reflected heat off of walls or especially if it's a wall of glass that will often create just kind of a dead zone where nothing will grow other than maybe like prickly pear cactus or if you have like a exhaust vent that's constantly blowing air onto a portion of the roof. I didn't mention there was maintenance it also kind of depends on what your goal for the project is all eco roofs in portland or in this general area end up getting weeds on them it might take a few years for them to get well established but eventually they'll be there and if you want to fight them you just have to make sure that they never go to seed but once they go to seed it's pretty much a lost cause if you have grasses and things that have gone to seed up there that's just the way the eco roof is going to be from that point on unless you take the soil out and start over so is that a big deal? I mean, it's still managing stormwater. It's still providing all these benefits, but something to think about if your goal is to maintain a certain kind of plant aesthetic from the design stage forward. Um, as I mentioned, you typically irrigation is debatable. You can avoid it if you really don't want to use it, but it's something you want to keep an eye on all the time because in our really dry summer, sometimes the roof can really suffer a bit. We've experimented a bit with a red cinder mulch layer on top of the existing soils an inch or two deep, and it's actually on top of the seed and cuttings. And that seems to work pretty well for, I think, keeping the soil damper a bit longer and the, keeping the plants a bit happier. Um, but weeding is inevitable. We have a lot of resources on our website. The Green Roof Information Think Tank is a nonprofit that pre coronavirus they met about once per month in a bar typically in Portland. And it's a mix of folks from academia and folks from government organizations and students and just anyone interested practitioners in the field. And there's often a speaker, a topic, and just a kind of free flowing discussion about green roof issues. We also have a resource list on our website, as well as um, case studies from that incentive grant that we had from 2008 to 2013. So there's about 140 case studies online, which are a valuable resource. And lots of do it yourself guides and other types of guides. They're almost all about 10 years old, but I think the information in them is still good. Nice photos. Yeah, that's all I got. I went through that quite quickly. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. If I didn't go as deep into something as you hoped, or if I skipped over anything, let me know. Um, thank you for listening.